I think we should get started. Welcome. This is our first event in a series of events we have planned on what's happening to today's Middle East. And we're doing a variety of uh, events. Some of them are very small uh, discussions. Some of them are larger discussions like this. If you are interested, uh, let me know. Because for the smaller discussions, um, I'd like to know who's interested so I can have you come. Um, and I think we'll probably have two more in November. We'll let you know the dates and times and speakers as we go forward. But, but make sure to be in touch with us if you're particularly interested. Um, so today we have with us, and I am pleased to have with us, David Phillips, who's been a longtime colleague <coughs> and friend, and who has done a deep dive for many years now into Middle Eastern policy, into the, um, into the various tensions that have brought the region apart, uh, into the Kurds. He's educated me about the Kurds several times, or at least tried to. Um, it recently, about refugees, he's written about Iraq, he's written about Syria, uh, you name it. He's at least thought about it if he hasn't written about it. Currently, he is directing the program on peace building and rights at Columbia University's Institute for Human Rights. But he has been affiliated with a number of organizations throughout his career, and we've, we've handed out a bio on him that, that you can see. His two most recent books, and I um, suggest that you read them both, one is called The Kurdish Spring, A New Map for the Middle East. I mean, this, this idea of a new map for the Middle East sort of puts in perspective what's wrong with the Middle East, that there's all these ideas for how to redivide, rethink, re, re, reunite different parts of the Middle East. And um, it's just a, it's, it's a moving uh, target that I, I, I wish we could get our hands around. And the other book, which he wrote prior to that, that's worthwhile taking a look at right now, is Liberating Kosovo. Uh, today's format is going to be as follows. David's going to give a few um, opening remarks, his overview of uh, the situation as he sees it. And I will uh, lead off the Q&A, uh, but mostly I'm going to rely on you to ask your questions. Um, and then we can have more food if there's any left. So go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. How are we doing with the technology? Is it working? Yeah. Great. Good. So, uh, Maraba, thank you very much, Karen. It's great to be here. I must say, you have very spiffy facilities. Okay. If Columbia builds a new building, a week later it'll look shabby. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to be here with you and with your audience. Thank you for having me. Uh, Turkey joined NATO in 1952. And for the next 50 years, it was a member in good standing, highly valued, making worthwhile contributions. We need to be realistic in understanding that NATO is much more than just a security alliance. NATO is also a coalition of countries with shared values. Countries who participate in the North Atlantic Alliance share a commitment to human rights and to democracy. Because of uh, the current Turkish government's support uh, for jihadi groups in Syria, um, its Islamist orientation, uh, President Erdogan's authoritarianism, and Turkey's anti-democratic practices, simply put, if NATO were being established today, Turkey would not qualify as a member. Now, that always wasn't the case. Over the past 50 years, Turkey and the United States have enjoyed a close strategic partnership and close cooperation in a number of important areas. U.S. and Turkish troops fought side by side during the Korean conflict. Uh, during the Cold War, Turkey was the eastern flank of NATO, played a critical role in containing the Soviet Union. Under President Turgut Özal, who I had the honor of meeting several times, Turkey helped monitor Saddam Hussein. It protected <coughs> Iraqi Kurds by permitting U.S. warplanes to use its bases, first in Operation Provide Comfort and then Operation Northern Watch. Turkey was always heralded as a secular Muslim country uh, in the tradition of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. It acted as a bridge and as a moderating influence 
to the broader Muslim community, especially countries in Central Asia. After September 11th, Turkey became a staging ground for coalition forces in Afghanistan, and Turkey assumed the overall responsibility of command for ISAF. Turkey experienced a terrible financial crisis in 2001, and in response to that, Turkish voters elected the Justice and Development Party, the AKP, um, with 34% of the votes on elections in November of 2002. Because of Turkey's electoral law that requires parties to have a 10% threshold to be seated in the parliament, 34% of the votes translated into two-thirds of the Turkish Grand National Assembly's uh, parliamentary seats. Uh, in 1999, Turkey became an EU candidate. There was some concern about whether Erdogan would continue along that EU course. Uh, immediately upon the election result, he reaffirmed Turkey's commitment to joining the EU. He also pledged to fulfill the Copenhagen criteria, uh, which had been adopted by the European Commission in 2002, essentially a roadmap for Turkey's candidacy, reform of the National Security Council, to subordinate the military to civilian authority, other rights-based reforms that are implicit in the acquis communitaire, 60,000 pages of rules for joining the EU. In particular, uh, Europeans were concerned about freedom of expression and the application of Article 8 of the Anti-Terror Act and Article 301 of the Penal Code, which were used to suppress freedom of expression. There were widespread concerns in Washington also about Erdogan's commitment to secularism and liberalization. I was affiliated with the State Department as a senior advisor at the time. I was privy to discussions, and U.S. officials uh, wanted to judge Erdogan by his actions, not by what he had said. And that's because what he had said was particularly alarming. Uh, we know he was born to a poor family in the Black Sea, that he rose to prominence through the ranks of Turkey's Islamic parties and conservative organizations. When he won the election in 1994 to become mayor of Istanbul, he declared himself, quote, the Imam of Istanbul, and he opened the first city council session by reciting a verse from the Quran. This was unheard of in the Kemalist culture of Turkey. <coughs> Uh, as mayor, he condemned contraception, banned alcohol in public places, ordered the widespread renovation of mosques. At a 1998 rally in the village of Sirt, he said, the mosques are our barracks, the domes are helmets, the minarets are bayonets, and the faithful are soldiers. He was convicted of fomenting public disorder, spent four months in prison, after the election that put the AKP in power of 2002, he famously pronounced, democracy is like a streetcar. You get off when you reach your destination. Despite all these worrisome remarks, Erdogan did take significant steps to right <coughs> Turkey's troubled economy and put its financial house in order. He imposed fiscal discipline. He reduced runaway inflation, sky-high interest rates, imposed curbs on the overvalued Turkish lira. He negotiated a $39.5 billion rescue package and standby agreement with the IMF. And the funds were used to shrink the pension system, downsize the bloated public sector. He reduced inflation to 13%, its lowest level in 30 years. So his economic accomplishments in the first years of AKP's rule should be mentioned. More than a decade of single-party rule in Turkey has distorted Erdogan's views about accountability and democratic governance. I spoke with a U.S. official right after the Gezi Park incident of May 28, 2013, and he said everything changed with Gezi Park. Environmental groups were protesting plans to uh, build a mall in a public green space in Istanbul. The police came in, cracked down with excessive force. There were mass arrests. The police brutality spread from Istanbul to, 60, to 70 cities across the country. 
The crackdown in Gezi Park was part and parcel of a broader crackdown on basic rights and freedom of expression. Since 2007, uh, when he won elections on July 22, the AKP ratcheted up pressure on journalists and on opponents. They arrested 500 journalists and military officers and accused them of plotting against Erdogan's government. <coughs> Reports about Operation Sledgehammer and other conspiracies abounded. The Committee to Protect Journalists ranked Turkey 154th out of 179 countries in terms of media freedom. In addition, the Turkish authorities used tax prosecution as a way of trying to muzzle the free press. The Doğan group was, a particularly, was particularly targeted by the authorities. And just last week, a few days before the upcoming elections on November 1, uh, the executive board of the Koza İpek holding was removed, the government appointed new trustees, effectively putting Bugun, Millet, Bugun, and Kanal Turk TV stations under government control. No event highlighted the personality of Recep Tayyip Erdogan more than the events in Syria. Upon assuming office, Erdogan and Assad established good personal relations. Turkey initiated a policy of economic diplomacy, invested a billion dollars in Syria, it put forward a free trade agreement enabling a five billion dollar trade package. Gaziantep became a shopping destination for Syrians. Erdogan and Assad resolved a border dispute in Hatay province that dated back uh, to 1938. Assad made a state visit in 2004 and again in 2007, the first state visit by a Syrian head of government in decades. Ahmed Davidolo, then the foreign minister, visited Syria 40 times. So when in 2011, civil strife was sparked in Syria, Erdogan sought to use his personal influence there to moderate Assad's behavior. He urged him strongly to engage with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, although his entreaties were rebuffed as Assad continued his attacks against Sunni Arabs. The rhetoric from Erdogan became increasingly confrontational <coughs> as he demanded regime change. Erdogan supported President Obama's insistence, quote, that Assad must go. He also supported the red line that the U.S. drew, warning against the use of chemical weapons. Although when it became clear that the U.S. was unwilling to take action, reluctant to deepen its military involvement, Turkey stepped into the breach and started to systematically support jihadi groups who were fighting in Syria in order to overthrow the regime of Bashar al-Assad. This involves support to the al-Qaeda-affiliated Jabhat al-Nusra Front, Salafist groups such as Arar al-Sham, as well as the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. When the Geneva process collapsed and Kofi Annan and then Lakhtar Brahimi resigned as the mediators, Turkey continued to intensify its support. And this was really done in plain sight. It was done through the MEET, the National Intelligence Agency, as well as a range of Muslim charities with which Erdogan and his family had relationship. It's been dubbed the Jihadi Highway. Money, weapons, logistics were systematically transferred. Wounded Islamic State fighters appeared in Turkish hospitals for medical care. A friend of mine who is a doctor in Turkey often said that wounded warriors would show up in the hospital without any identification, no charge would be sought, and they would receive the best medical care that Turkey had to offer. It's not surprising that the AKP-led government forge this close cooperation with ISIS, because the two organizations share a mindset and, a, and values. When the Deputy Prime Minister of Turkey says that women shouldn't smile or laugh in public because it draws attention to them, this is something you'd expect to hear from Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, not an elected official in a democratic government of Turkey. Erdogan thought he could control ISIS, from the West, Turkey looks like a Middle Eastern country, but to ISIS, Turks are kafir, non-believers. 
In fact, most Arabs who are subscribing to extremist ideologies view Turks as westernized degenerates. There were increasing reports about Turkey's official involvement with extremist groups. I went to a meeting at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I had written and published extensively about it. I don't know if the comments were directed to me, probably not, but Erdogan challenged the audience. He said, this is a systematic effort to defame Turkey. If there is evidence of this support to ISIS, put it forward. So I established a research team with researchers at Colombia, in Europe, and in Turkey. We were agnostic on the conclusion, but we found scores and scores of credible press reports itemizing Turkey's support to the IS. And we published that. Um, we published that in Turkish, and I published it in my column on the Huffington Post. Um, Bilal Erdogan, the son of the president, sent a pre-action legal letter from his lawyers to the Huffington Post in London, demanding they remove it from their website. To the HuffPost's credit, they did not do so. There was plenty of evidence giving authority to those claims. Turks became increasingly disenchanted with their country's growing involvement with Syria. A 2013 study by the German Marshall Fund found that 72% of Turks think their government should stay out of Syria, quote, completely. Fear spread of cross-border violence. The Rahanli bombings in Hatay province on May 11th, 2013, uh, was an incident in which two gar car bombs exploded five kilometers from Turkey's Syrian border. At least 51 people were killed and 140 injured in the attack. Turks also were reacting to the growing population flow of Syrians crossing the border seeking sanctuary in Turkey. Today, more than half of Syria's population is displaced by conflict. There are up to five million refugees who have crossed the border, eight million in internally displaced persons within Syria. Two thirds of the population is dependent on humanitarian aid. Of these refugees, more than two million went to Turkey, and Turkey says its cost in providing for them exceeded eight billion euros. As this was happening, I went to a senior Turkish official and on behalf of a leading refugee organization where I'm affiliated, offered to provide assistance. We had funds in order to assist. The reaction of the Turkish official was, give us the money, we'll do the work. So it's hard to have sympathy for Turkey's costs, given its unwillingness to partner with credible and capable organizations. Russia's recent intervention has exacerbated the suffering. Russian warplanes have escalated violence across the country, displacing tens of thousands in just a few weeks. There have been 120,000 people uprooted this past month in Aleppo, Hama, and Idlib provinces. Relief workers with the UNHCR are warning that Syria is facing one of the worst humanitarian crises since the outset of the Civil War. Turkey's response to this was to seal its border and to go to the European Union and demand $3.5 billion as a payout, 3.5 billion euros as a payout in order to participate in the EU's humanitarian action plan. Erdogan also insisted that the EU provide visa liberalization for Turkish passport holders, and he asked for accelerated consideration of Turkey's EU candidacy. This is as countries like Greece, are overwhelmed with the flow of migrants and refugees to their shores. 9,000 people a day are arriving in Lesbos. <coughs> the humanitarian corridor from Greece to Northern Europe is just overwhelmed. There's something cynical about taking money from Europe to keep people displaced by trauma and conflict in Turkey when they aspire and dream of a better life elsewhere in Europe. Today, Turkey is a deeply divided society. There are about 20 million Kurds who live in Turkey. During the civil war between the Turkish military and the PKK, up to 40,000 people died. 
When Erdogan came to power, the Kurds were called Mountain Turks. In the first years under the AKP, they gradually acquired more rights. Turkey became a far more multicultural and multilingual society. Erdogan lifted the state of emergency in southeastern provinces. Leyla Zana, who I visited in her maximum security prison in Ankara several times, and three other Kurdish MPs were released after being jailed for 10 years for speaking Kurdish in the parliament when it came time to take their oath of office. There was also a discreet dialogue initiated between Abdullah Öcalan, the head of the PKK, and Meet. This led to the declaration by the PKK of a ceasefire on March 23 of 2013. Despite this declaration, the peace process was languishing. Erdogan announced a democracy package. Uh, he proposed to allow Kurdish language TV, Kurdish education in private schools, to legalize Kurdish language courses, but this just simply wasn't enough for the Kurds of Turkey who had suffered decades of discrimination. The Kurds demanded what they called democratic autonomy, but Turkey, fearing dismemberment and fragmentation, refused to devolve power. Thousands of uh, civil society members associated with the Union of Kurdish Communities called the KCK were arrested and they still languish in jail. Despite repeated appeals from the US and Brussels, there was no action on repealing Article 8 of the Anti-Terror Act or Article 301 of the Penal Code. So Turkey moved to elections last June 7. And for the first time since 2002, <clears throat> the AKP failed to win a parliamentary majority. Uh, they won 41% of the vote. It was expected that they would be the largest vote getter. But the big winner in that election was the pro-Kurdish People's Democratic Party, HDP, which gained 13% of the vote. In so doing, it crossed the threshold of 10%, allowing it to take 80 seats in the parliament. In so doing, it denied the AKP the supermajority that Erdogan was looking for in order to rewrite the Constitution and create a strong executive presidency with himself at the helm. What the election showed is that Turks value secularism and a system of checks and balances. AKP won 41 percent of the vote. No real effort was made to form a coalition government, and Erdogan steered the country towards early elections, and those elections will be held on November 1 of this week. On a personal level, and I didn't learn this from my conversation with Mr. Erdogan, but it's widely known that he was enraged with Kurds for supporting the HDP. He called the head of the party, Salahattin Demirtas, an agent of the PKK, Erdogan, through Davidolu, blocked efforts to form a coalition government. He also ordered airstrikes against the PKK in Iraqi Kurdistan and Turkey and against its sister organization, the PYD, in Syria. On the 24th of July, the U.S. and Turkey announced an agreement to allow the use of Inchirlik Air Force Base in southeastern Turkey for the multinational coalition's fight against the Islamic State. The next day, Erdogan cynically seized on this deal to bomb the PKK outposts in Kandil. There were very few strikes launched by the Turkish Air Force against ISIS. Almost all of them were targeting the Kurds. Erdogan promised Turkish voters that, this, uh, that these attacks would, quote, go on indefinitely. Jamil Bayak, who is in Kandil and one of the PKK leaders, said, the Turkish claim they are fighting the Islamic State, but in fact they are fighting the PKK. They are doing it to limit the PKK's fight against the Islamic State. Turkey is actually protecting the Islamic State. Richard Holbrook, with whom I worked on the Balkans, said of Milosevic, he tried to solve a problem by creating a bigger one. Well, creating a conflict with the PKK is Erdogan's effort to take a page from Milosevic's playbook. He's pandering to nationalists, demonizing the PKK, and marginalizing the Kurds in Turkey 
with the hope of gaining the supermajority that he seeks at elections on Sunday. At the same time as es fighting and violence has escalated along Turkey's border, it's also escalated within Turkey. On June 5th, at a rally in Diyarbakir, there were a series of bombings, several people were killed and 100 wounded. On the 20th of July, in Suruç, near the Kobani border, 32 people were killed. And just recently, on the 10th of, of October in Ankara, there were bombings in which 102 people were killed. So the question is, who did it? The Turkish authorities were quick to point blame to the Islamic State. But ISIS didn't claim responsibility for these bombings, and they always do for their attacks. In fact, they don't only claim responsibility. They videotape them, they package them, they disseminate them through social media. So these bombings were a little out of character for ISIS. Why didn't they take responsibility? Aksham, a pro-government paper, reported that Assad told the PKK to do it. But most of the victims at these rallies were HDP supporters. So why would the PKK possibly bomb rallies of its core constituents? And make no mistake about it, any Kurd who is a citizen of Turkey who aspires for greater rights has spiritual fealty for the PKK's struggle. The Kurdish National Congress said Erdogan is responsible for the massacre. Bergun called Erdogan, quote, a murderer. Jim Hurriyet said, quote, a bomb exploded as police stood by and watched. The HDP's Demirtas said this is not an attack against the unity of our state and our union. This is an attack by our state against our people. In yesterday's New York Times, Tim Arango, a very respected journalist who I know, wrote, the widespread assumption that events are being manipulated behind the scenes and outside the law by a web of shadowy forces called the deep state. Now this conflict in the region has recently spread to involve the PYD, who are the Kurdish party in Syria. It's called the Democratic Union Party. Its militias are the People's Protection Forces. And make no mistake about it, when the U.S. talks about uh, allies in Syria, there is no better ally than the PYD and the, the YPG, who are fighting on the ground. It took a while, but at the last minute, the U.S. launched airstrikes in Kobani. Forty percent of the defenders of Kobani were Kurdish women. ISIS succeeded in doing what no Kurdish leader had ever done. It brought the YPG, the PKK, Pajak from Iran, and the Peshmerga from Iraqi Kurdistan together in a united front to oppose Islamic extremism. Thanks to the 11th hour intervention by the US, including the airlift of weapons, ISIS was ultimately defeated in Kobani. And I tip my hat to all the fighters and defenders of Kobani for their sacrifice and their very heroic struggle. The U.S. has continued to deepen security cooperation with the YPG. Last week, it airdropped 50 tons of ammunition to YPG and, quote, Arab fighters as part of a preliminary effort to launch a campaign to retake the city of Raqqa in eastern Syria, which is an Islamic State stronghold. Now, Turkey says the PKK and the PYD are the same. And they are, by all accounts, sister organizations. But there's an important distinction in international law. The PKK is listed as a foreign terrorist organization. And the PYD is not. So any kind of cooperation with the PYD doesn't violate restrictions imposed under FTO-related statutes. And for that matter, let me go on record by saying that the decision to list the PKK as an FTO was taken right after 9-11. There was a deal done in the White House in exchange for Turkey's leadership of ISAF. It should never have been listed as a terrorist organization. And if we're serious about a peace process and democracy in Turkey, we should remove the PKK from the FTO list yesterday. 
Right now in northern Syria, what is called Rojava is a reality. The, Sur the Kurds of Syria are effectively linking the provinces of Afrin, Jazeera, and Kobani. Uh, they are in a position to establish a buffer zone across the border between Syria and Turkey. To Erdogan, this is anathema, the idea of a Kurdish state in Syria mirroring what the Iraqi Kurds have done in Iraqi Kurdistan is Turkey's worst nightmare. We saw in today's paper an announcement that the U.S. was going to increase its deployment of special forces uh, in Syria. Make no mistake about it, what we're talking about is working more closely on the ground in the battlefield with the YPG. We also saw yesterday a statement from President Erdogan saying that Turkey would do, quote, whatever is necessary to prevent the YPG from crossing the Euphrates River and going west. And he also added, as a dig to the United States, quote, we don't have to ask anyone's permission. So imagine this frightful scenario where Turkey, a NATO member, is attacking, and they have launched two air attacks against the YPG, we, as the principal in the multinational coalition in the fight against terror, are supporting the YPG with logistics and weapons. And we're put in a position where we have to either stand by our formal NATO treaty ally, Turkey, or our functional ally, the YPG, which is on the ground fighting ISIS. We're talking about deconflicting with Russia. We need a program to deconflict with Turkey as well. And if Turkish planes are warned, if a deconflicting plan is adopted, if Turkish planes are warned not to attack the YPG, then the U.S. itself is going to have to consider all necessary measures to protect its ally in the battlefield. So the result of all these policies is Turkey's increasing international isolation. In 2004, I had a um, debate uh, on the pages of foreign affairs with Wolfgang Schauble, who's now the uh, foreign economics minister, uh, the economics minister of Germany. And Schauble wrote, Phillips fails to consider the consequences of acceptance. I was arguing to fast track Turkey's membership as a stimulus for further reform. He wrote, would an EU with Turkey as a member be able to continue to build an ever closer political union or speak with one voice? Europe's hesitancy to admit Turkey is an awareness of the potential problems that could arise from integration of a country that shares hundreds of miles of borders with Syria. From my position in 2004 where I was urging closer integration between Turkey and Euro-Atlantic institutions to today, Turkey has failed to step up and realize its potential as a Western ally, a country that shares values with the United States and with Europe. President Obama will go to Antalya for the G20 meeting. I'm sure he'll have a bilateral with President Erdogan on the 17th when he's there. And he needs to make a couple of very strong points. The first is to strongly encourage Turkey to implement a ceasefire with the PKK. We've known for decades that there is no military solution to the Kurdish grievances for greater cultural and political rights in Turkey. The second point that President Obama needs to make is that Turkey must stop attacking the YPG. He needs to let the Turks know very clearly that the YPG is not a terrorist organization, that they are now a strategic partner with the United States, and an attack by the, by the, the Turkish military on the YPG will be considered as an attack upon U.S. interests in the region. Erdogan also must be encouraged to accept the election results. Now, I'm not going to spe speculate about what happens on Sunday. The pundits and the pollsters are all saying that the vote is largely going to be similar to what happened on June 7th. Either way, Erdogan will either ignore those results or steal the votes. His goal is and has always been to establish an executive presidency 
If he doesn't have the supermajority in the parliament to do that constitutionally, he will just act as though he had the support and continue to consolidate power and act with arrogance towards Turkish citizens, polarizing the society and making it even more deeply divided. And lastly, the U.S. should issue a visa to Sally Muslim, who is the <coughs> co-chair of the PYD. I've invited him to Colombia to give a little seminar on the Kurds' role in Syria. He submitted his application at the U.S. Embassy in Stockholm in 2012. They still, they still haven't acted on his visa application. If we're cooperating on the battlefield, we need to also cooperate diplomatically and politically. Overall, it's time for the U.S. to adopt a reality-based policy. We need now to see Turkey as it is, not as it was or how we wish it would be. And Turkey is Islamist, authoritarian, anti-democratic, it's proven itself to be unreliable in the fight against ISIS and as a NATO security partner. So I'm very pleased to share my views with you here today. And Karen, I'll be happy to take questions. So thank you all. So um, that was completely depressing. <laughs> but um, thank you anyway. I have a few questions. I remember when Erdogan came to New York six years ago and gave a very different speech than the kind of language you've alluded to now, in which he talked about Turkey as a bridge, not from one um, Islamist country to another, as you referred to, but between the East and the West, and really you know, put Turkey out there as the, the, the only country, in his words, that could really translate from two very different cultures. And, um, and I remember the questions afterwards, which were not very critical of that particular point of view. Um, I'm wondering if, and I noticed that two weeks ago, Angela Merkel, I think The Guardian reported, um, said that in return for these two million refugees that are in Turkey, that the EU should consider, to seriously consider giving Turkey membership in the EU, almost an as, as an exchange. So my question in all of this is twofold. The first is, was there a moment when it was, does the West bear some responsibility for saying no to Turkey early on and therefore um, creating a scenario where Turkey could go down this path that you've described? And two, is there dissension in Europe um, from your point of view, in terms of how they evaluate Turkey's potential role uh, in the future. So the relationship between the United States and Turkey um, hit a fork in the road on March 1, 2003. Say what you will about the U.S. invasion and occupation by the Bush administration of Iraq. Mm -hmm. The decision by the Turkish Grand National Assembly not to authorize the transfer of the 3rd Infantry Division yeah. through Turkey into northern Iraq deeply distorted the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the violence that occurred after Saddam was toppled was a result of the fact that we just didn't have the manpower for, stiff, for phase four stability operations. There was a huge amount of anti-Americanism in Turkey as a result of that vote. U.S. officials also spoke disparagingly of Turks, saying they were like carpet salesmen. Mm -hmm. I think they said they wanted $10 billion for every thousand troops to transit through Turkey. Now, this is, this is not a transaction in the Sukh. This is a matter of regional and international security. So um, the relationship had always been close. It took a turn for the worse after March 1, 2003. Um, it didn't really worsen until later in that decade. But let me just say without attribution that I recently spoke to a former U.S. ambassador to Turkey who then assumed a very high prominent position in the State Department, and he said this is just a classic case of absolute power corrupting absolutely. Uh, Erdogan has lost his bearings, yeah. and he's had too much power for too long with too little accountability and no institutionalized system of checks and balances, and that's what's deeply distorted his relationship to other agencies in Turkey. Mm 
Just on the subject of Angela, Angela Merkel, she doesn't have the authority no, to doesn't. invite Turkey's membership. Uh, it's a long process to negotiate the acquis. Even if, Turk, even if the EU as a whole were favorably disposed, uh, it is years until Turkey is going to be able to accede. And given the current practice of uh, anti-human rights crackdown, and attacks on freedom of expression. Turkey is further from EU membership today than it's ever been. You mentioned Obama's upcoming trip, um, and you outlined what you think he needs to hear. Do you think there's any possibility that that's what he would do, to say they needed to, I'm just asking. So far be it from me to disparage <laughs> the president. Uh, but yes. You could disparage his advisors. <laughs> well, I won't disparage anyone, but I will say that um, it's time for a much more uh, realistic approach. And this doesn't have to be done in public. This can be done in a private discussion between the two presidents. Obama can ask his advisors to leave the room, and he should communicate very clearly to Erdogan what red lines really exist today. And Erdogan should take those red lines as significant. This isn't something that the U.S. is going to walk back. If Turkey is going to be continuing its support for the Islamic State, if it's going to be attacking the U.S. ally in the fight against IS in Syria, there have to be repercussions. The U.S. should recognize who its friends are and who are its adversaries. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's crystal clear that when you look at the Middle East today, whether it's in Iraq or in Syria, the U.S. has no better friend than the Kurds. There's an adage that says the Kurds have no friend but the mountains. Today, the U.S. has no friend but the Kurds. Um, one final question, and then I'm going to turn it to you, which is that there's been a lot of um, uh, reports written about the flow of ISIS foreign fighters through Turkey, which is something you didn't, you know, directly address. And um, particularly, you notice that in uh, indictments of Americans who have gone abroad, they go to Turkey. Europeans the same way sometimes. They go to Turkey as a way of getting into Syria. Um, do you think it's possible to, to stop that? Is that something that the President's going to talk to him about in your general scenario? Or? So I did talk about the jihadi highway. You did. So um, I don't want to diminish the facilities that Turkey has provided to extremists to transit yeah. from yeah. Ataturk Airport right yeah. to the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, you know, that occurred in a systematic and institutionalized way between 2012 and 2014. I think Turkey now has cottoned on to the fact that the Islamic State is not their friend, that they have IS cells across Turkey, and in a way they've helped to create a monster. And the monster will take a toll in Turkey as well as in other countries of the region. Turkey says that it is doing all it can to prevent the transfer of foreign fighters, there's a UN Security Council resolution calling on Turkey and other states to interdict their, their, tra their transit. Uh, Turkey says, well, the U U.S. has a long border with Mexico and you can't control it. How do you expect us to control our border with Syria? Yeah. Well, I know of no more highly uh, developed security apparatus than the one that exists in Turkey. And I just simply don't believe that these foreign fighters are moving un with, through Turkey uh, okay. without the knowledge and or the support of Turkey's National Intelligence Agency. I also deliberately didn't take a position on who was responsible for the bombings in Turkey, mm -hmm. but I find it uh, remarkable that within hours of the bombing, the, the Islamic State is blamed. In the same breath, the PKK is accused of playing a role. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a long history in Turkey from the Susurluk incident to today, and even pr prior to Susurluk, of the Turkish security apparatus staging attacks and making them look as though they were conducted by others as a way of fomenting division in society. So I'm not in a position to judge, but this sure smells like a state operation to me. Your questions, your way in the back, and you're just going to have to speak up. And could you identify yourself so I know? Yes. And make sure it's a question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, two things. One, if you have any sense of whether or not the, the new rounds of talks on Syria, in which 
Turkey is a participant and there's a single woman and no Syrians have any chance of going anywhere. And two, and you made the connections between Turkey and Erdogan and obviously the Kurds and the EU and the US, but you said nothing about the autocrats of the North, Putin and the autocrats of the South, and that's the Yahoo. And how do you see that relationship or relationship? So there's a theory in conflict resolution called ripeness. And that um, implies that combatants will stop fighting when they reach a certain saturation point, when the human misery toll reaches a certain level. I don't see, Tur I don't see Syria having reached that moment of ripeness. They may have been heading in that direction, um, but Russia's base in Latakia and Russia's operations in support of ground forces that include the Quds Force and Hezbollah have given new wind to Syria and a, a new belief that they can actually win this war on the ground. <coughs> when we got to Dayton to negotiate an end to the Bosnian War, it was because the tide had turned in the battlefield and the parties felt that they had an interest in locking in the lines that were in place. I suspect that when we do get to a negotiated agreement on Syria, it will probably look a lot like the Dayton Peace Agreement. Highly decentralized, local control over militias, strong authority for local government. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. And sadly, that means that the population flow of civilians who are victimized by this conflict will continue. And the challenges that refugees represent to Europe and to the corridor countries are going to grow. More questions over there. Uh, hi, my name is Jordan Reimer. Uh, one question is, why do you think that the Turkish government is okay with the KRG and indeed uh, the Turkish government has like, all these oil deals with the KRG, they have a good relationship, but that the Turkish government would not be okay with a similar situation for the Kurds in Syria? On the table outside is a task force report that we recently published on Iraqi Kurdistan. So I'd urge you to pick up a copy and have a look at it. Your question is based on the assumption that it's okay with the KRG. Uh, on the 10th of August, 2014, when the Islamic State pivoted from Samarra and attacked Mahmur, the KRG sent a very senior envoy to Istanbul to petition the Turks to give them weapons so they could defend themselves. The Turks said, can't do. We have a presidential election coming up. You know, you're going to have to take this fight on your own. Later on, they sent the envoy again, and he was rebuffed a second time. This time it was because of the Turkish hostages that were taken in Mosul and that were being held. So I think it's a... Um, it's a little bit of an overstatement to say that Turkey is okay with the KRG. They did establish a very strong strategic partnership. The oil transport route from the north, from Kirkuk to the Mediterranean port of Jehan, uh, was pumping, I think, 600,000 barrels a day. Turkey benefited enormously from the windfall in Iraqi Kurdistan. The airport in Erbil, all the major highways, the universities were all built by Turkish construction companies. So it was really a transactional relationship. That has not translated towards a true strategic partnership. And the Iraqi Kurds today, because of their geography, don't have many friends. They're trying very hard to revitalize their partnership with Turkey. You know, what I've advised them, and I'll continue to advise during my visit to Erbil, on the 17th of next month, is that Turkey is not a reliable friend of Iraqi Kurdistan, and you need to explore multiple outlets to the world, because in a moment, Turkey can shut down the pipeline and isolate you. Do you think Israel could be a potential partner for the KRG? Um, the Israeli president and prime minister and foreign minister have all called for the recognition of Iraqi Kurdistan's independence. Both countries share something. They're small states surrounded by adversaries. That being said, beyond the provision of some drones and some military equipment, there's really no large role for Israel to play 
in Iraqi Kurdistan. And the Iraqi Kurds themselves are cautious because they don't want to antagonize their Arab neighbors by appearing too close to the government in Israel. More questions. Joshua. Uh, Joshua Dreytel. Just to look in another direction, uh, given the historically tense, maybe charitable word, relationship between Turkey and Greece and the precarious state of Greece and the influx of migrants to Greece from Syria through Turkey, do you anticipate any issues arising in that relationship? So I was in Greece last week uh, working with Greek and Macedonian officials on the, the refugee flow. Um, and it is a very serious problem in Greece. And I think so far this year, there have been 537,000 migrants that have landed in Greece, in Lesbos and elsewhere. Uh, this week, there are more than 9,000 uh, boat people arriving in Greece from Turkey each day. And with the onset of winter, with the potential that Germany might close its borders, with the increased conflict resulting from Russia's involvement, those numbers are going to go up. They're not going to go down. And the conditions for sea transit and passage through the corridor is going to, are going to get worse and worse. That being said, you know, the Greeks have responded pretty well. They set up reception centers. They've done a lot of that with their own financing, which is sparse. They've received some EU support. And I think that the Greeks are kind of glad to get their economic crisis off the headline and to be reported as a country of sanctuary for these asylum seekers. It paints a much more generous portrait of Greece than the reporting we saw over the summer when Greece was on the brink of bankruptcy and trying to negotiate its latest bailout. So my, my um, commendation is to Greece for stepping up. My question to the Turks is why all of a sudden did these hundreds of thousands of refugees decide that they wanted to leave Turkey and try to make it to Europe? Did they just reach a point where they felt that they had no prospect in Turkey? They can't register for work. They don't benefit from any official services. Or was there something else that motivated them to leave Turkey and go elsewhere? I don't have an answer to that. This side of the room. The Obama administration has shown an uncanny ability to, to f not distinguish between its friend and its foe. No clearer example exists than what's happening in Baghdad. The, the weapons that are being shipped from Russia to Latakia go through Iranian and Iraqi airspace. On the 5th of September, we sent an envoy to Baghdad to petition the Iraqi government to close their airspace so the weapons couldn't be delivered. You would think that after spending $3 trillion, that after losing 4,441 men and women, 40,000 maimed and injured, that the government in Baghdad might have been slightly more responsive to our concern. They said they'd take it under advisement and did nothing. While the General Assembly is meeting in New York, Russia, Iraq, Iran, and Syria announced that they decided to establish an intelligence sharing consortium. The U.S. knew nothing about it. So if we're going to have a reality-based policy, 
we need to recognize who are friendly countries and who are our adversarial countries. And after everything we did for Iraq and all of the commitment of troops and treasure there, I would expect more from the government of Iraq than we see. My conclusion has been for Iraq and Syria and the region that the U.S. really has no reliable security partner or friend except for the Iraqi Kurds and the Syrian Kurds who have shown a commitment and a capability to be the point of the spear and who at least rhetorically share Western values. So we should be increasing our support to them. If they're asking for heavy and offensive weapons to take on the Islamic State, if they want to participate in the battle for Raqqa or Ramadi, uh, then we should give them that support. Ash Carter talked about the three R's, Ramadi, Raqqa, and raids. It's good that the U.S. participated in this raid in uh, south of Mosul to free these hostages last week. It's tragic that we lost a Delta Special Forces person during the raid. But we should be intensifying our assistance to our actual friends. And we should be reading the Riot Act to those countries that purport to be friendly and letting them know that we see them as they are, not as we wish them to be. So, so how, do you, how, how, do you, how do you bring them into the focus? The Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and Qataris are supporting Sunnis. Because you're not only dealing with a with with a with an interstate conflict. I got it. You're All also right. dealing with a religious conflict. Let, let me expand this question. I want to ask another okay. dimension I'm of it as well, <laughs> which is that you keep saying you want something realistic. But part of realistic is pragmatic, right? And I think just to, to expand the question a little bit, is it really realistic or pragmatic to say these are only two allies when we live in a world of nation states, sort of? And um, or we pretend to live in a world of nation states, that's how. And, and, and isn't, where's the nation state you know, component of what you're talking about? It can't just be these um, players that have so far been marginalized? Or can it be? Is that your... Well, let me see if I can address both questions that are related. Um, the reason why the Islamic State did so well in Western Iraq is because they were greeted there with open arms. The Sunni tribes welcomed them. And they did that because Iraq had become so deeply dysfunctional and polarized because of its own sectarian divisions that the Sunni tribes preferred to live <laughs> under the boot of the Islamic State that to live under the hegemony of an Iranian-backed government in Baghdad. Uh, right now there is um, a state in Western Iraq and it's called the Islamic State. And it's hard for me to see how it, their territorial gains get rolled back. You talked about being pragmatic. And um, for me, being pragmatic means acting in the national interest. So our national interest is to find friends and allies where we can. If they don't exist as nation states, then let's recognize them as a nation state. If Iraqi Kurdistan is going to conduct a referendum on independence, is going to move towards independence, then far be it from the United States to stand in its way. And if we're looking for friends in a region where we have done, we should be deepening our cooperation with the Kurds. That doesn't preclude working in cooperation with other states, including other Sunni majority states in the region. It just means that the U.S. projects its, uh, its diplomatic influence in a more effective way. I'm sure that if uh, we had the respect of our allies in the region and we sat down and told them how we wanted it to be, that they would sign on to that. The problem is that we've lost the respect because of our lack of commitment and follow through. You know, there's a lot of credibility that we have to recover. With our friends, the Kurds in Iraq and the Kurds in Syria, we should not leave them hanging. We shouldn't put them on the chopping block in exchange for some real politique that doesn't exist. Got it. Yeah. I'm Andy Von Salas. I litigate civil cases in New York City. I, uh, I don't need a lawyer. 
<laughs> Not yet. <coughs> I'm wondering about American politics, uh, which of course is preoccupied with an election that's going to happen in more than a year, but um, the uh, world is still going on. And I'm wondering if anybody in the uh, American political scene is really on board with it. You were talking about Obama, but is there anyone else in uh, American politics who has the political will to do anything about uh, some of these forces in the Mideast that you were talking about that need recognition or that need support? I don't hear about it if it's there. So foreign policy is rarely an election issue. And if well, you is there any political will even aside, or are you saying that the only political will there is right now is the election issue? Uh, the political will will exist among some Republicans who will use the failed counterterrorism campaign against ISIS to beat up on the Democrats and to beat up on Secretary Clinton for what they will claim are setbacks that occurred under her watch. I don't think that really mm, constitutes a principled, integrous foreign policy. Yeah. There are some Republican candidates. Uh, Rand Paul and Marco Rubio, who have talked about expanding military assistance to the Kurds. Uh, but they are a minority and a, and a quiet voice. What I do see potentially as an, as an election issue are Americans who are going to Iraq and Syria to fight the Islamic State. There are, there's a cohort of Christians who are looking at Syria and Iraq as the front line in a new crusade. I was going to ask, is this the Crusader pipeline? So I wouldn't say it's a crusader pipeline because those numbers are limited. And I don't want to somehow diminish their effort or minimize or ridicule it. But their numbers are growing. Um, when there are fatalities on the battlefield, uh, their sacrifice is going to resonate with an important section of the American electorate. And I would watch out for that factor. I think that that has the potential of be increasingly becoming an election year issue. I think we have time what are those numbers? I think they're in like 60 or 70 right now, so they're, they're small numbers. But um, you know, there's increasing number of media reports about them. I know from work that I did with the Kosovo Liberation Army that it started as two or three. Then Chris Hedges wrote an article, called them an, an army, and before you knew it, there were hundreds and then thousands. So, is that illegal? Is that illegal? Um, no, it's not actually. So I saw a State Department analysis saying that they would not prevent <coughs> U.S. citizens from going to Iraq or Syria and fighting. So, yeah, yeah. You know, so you're the lawyer, so you probably can help us understand that. So I expect, that, I expect that there's some political interpretation of that, and the Justice Department probably weighed in. No action has been taken to prevent U.S. citizens. That's right. There's an exception to the law, is what you're... It's just non-enforcement, which is enforced on the, on the, on the other side. Got it. We have time for one more question, I think. Maybe two. You, and then you just ask them in a row, and he'll answer both. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I wanted to touch on the refugee uh, issue. And could you speak up? And sit and identify yourself, please. Hey, Adrian, I'm a refugee response American organization that does work in Turkey. Uh, you, earlier, you characterized it as something cynical about taking money to keep people in Turkey with regards to the EU proposed deal. I wonder if you could comment on the perspective of the person making the offer or the entity making the offer in this case, which is the EU, not the party to which it's being made. Um, it seems to me that the onus would fall on the EU. And you, and then Thank you very much. Sorry if there was an meeting. <laughs> part of it. Anyway, uh, Sandy Kemper representing a few of uh, the UN law NGOs. Uh, this past week, I was at a meeting. I'm sorry, I only can summarize because we're at this, what stays, what it happens in the room stays in the room. I had to deal with Russia stating something quite different from what you are stating. There's a private Russia, what they're doing behind the scenes, and then there's the public one. And to the surprise even of one ambassador, shock hit the entire group of people in that room. <coughs> what, they want for Syria, uh, what they want for Syria and the Middle East extending into Turkey and other countries. Now, Obama's going to Turkey, and that's the 
what I heard, I can understand why your father's going to go there. How is Turkey going to deal with Putin and what he wants, Obama and particularly Congress, what they want? And they, but he, Turkey's going to be pushed in every direction. How is Turkey going to deal with this? Thank you. Because Putin is dead set on winning. Can we hear from this lady as a last question? Oh, of course, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Addison and John, I come from Kosovo, a journalist. Actually, I'm worried, coming from Balkans, I am worried about Turkish influence in Balkans. And you know that area I'm very good and you work there. Uh, my, my question is about this spreading of Islam way of Turkish in Kosovo and building a lot of ima a lot of mosques, being imams who then they are recruiting young people to join ISIS. Have you seen this risk before? Because this is, it's not just opinion, we have facts for that. So let me take that last question first. Um, a couple months ago in a meeting with the president of Macedonia, he said that there were 800 ethnic Albanians from Macedonia that had been to Syria, uh, 350 from Kosovo, and 200 from Albania. So the radicalization of ethnic Albanians from the region um, is a real challenge. That being said, the only group of people who are more pro-American than the Kurds are Albanians. So we need to study what motivates them to go? What do they do when they come back? How are they reintegrated into their community? And I'm working with um, uh, an Albanian center on um, peace and democracy to conduct that kind of sociological research as a basis for informing a more effective policy. Second part of your question, yes, we did see this before. You know, we saw after the Bosnian war, uh, Mujahideen had infiltrated some of the front lines and then they stayed behind they married Bosnian women, they radicalized the local population. So in the Balkans, this has been a challenge since 1995. So Turkey bears enormous influence through its economic diplomacy. Uh, whenever President Erdogan goes somewhere, he arrives on a TK plane with hundreds of businessmen and announces all kinds of deals. So Turkey has a lot of influence. I don't know if they're influencing the radicalization of the local population, um, but I do know that people in the Balkans, including Slavic Macedonians, are increasingly concerned about Turkey's presence and the potential for radicalization. No, no, I think uh, no, we, that's we, the last question, we're almost please. out of time, sorry. So uh, how does um, Russia's involvement affect uh, the approach to Turkey? Turkey all along has been demanding a no-fly zone. And um, it also wanted to establish safe areas. And it envisioned that Turkish soldiers would populate those safe areas in order to protect civilians. Two problems with that policy now. One is the Russians are controlling the skies along the border. And the US isn't going to establish a no-fly zone when we're talking about deconflicting with MiG-24s. So I don't think that is um, a realistic proposal coming from Turkey. And as far as establishing safe havens on the border, all those territories are controlled by the PYD and the People's Protection Forces. So if Turkey is envisioning deploying its ground forces into northern Syria, that's not viewed favorably by the Kurds from Syria. They would view that as an invasion and an occupation force, and then you would see all heck break out. And here again, the US will be in a very uncomfortable position of whether how we support our NATO ally and what do we do to assist our best friend in Syria who are the Syrian Kurds, the YPG. The first question about the EU offer, I wasn't in the room so I can't really say you know, who offered what. Uh, I do know that Erdogan has been speaking for some weeks about the burden on the Turkish economy of providing for all these refugees. And somehow I just don't imagine that he showed up in Brussels and the first question he got from Angela Merkel was, can we give you three and a half billion euros to help your situation? I suspect that the initiative for that came from Turkey. Uh, the idea that uh, 
as one Turkish analyst called it, a dirty deal was being negotiated where Turkey would get a payback to prevent refugees from seeking a better life in Europe, to me, just doesn't seem wholesome. And whether it came from Europe or whether it came from Erdogan, there was clearly a meeting of the minds. And to me, that is a dirty deal. It doesn't stand the, the test of the light when it comes to an effective humanitarian action program. Well, we are, we are out of time. But I just want to make a few um, concluding remarks. Um, and basically, to your, um, this administration doesn't know the difference between a friend and an enemy and hasn't been able to figure it out. And just to push back a little bit, friends and enemies seem to be changing constantly. And a friend one day, an enemy the next day, an affiliate of this one day, an affiliate of that another day. So I guess, I mean, what my takeaway today, in addition to just this wealth of, of wonderful information you've given us, um, is just that there's this, this part of the world, um, and who knows how far it will expand, is just in such tremendous flux. And I do think it's related to this, this, the, the state versus not yet state versus non-state actor. I mean, there are all these things that are, that are not part of the world as we've defined it before. So um, that's my takeaway. And, and, um, so, and the final thing is, is that I just want to double check with you. Your real impression of Sunday's election is that it doesn't matter what happens because whatever happens, Erdogan's going to win, he's going to be in control, he's going to do whatever it takes to make sure that he still can command in the way he's commanding now. Is that, is that basically what you uh, said? <laughs> so I can answer that efficiently by saying yes. Okay. But I can, also, sure. I can also say that um, if the votes are stolen and Erdogan, the HDP doesn't cross the threshold, and Erdogan claims to have the supermajority that he seeks, that all heck is going to break loose in Turkey. And it'll make the civil war of the 1980s and 1990s Know, look like a picnic. You know, the Kurds are not going to stand aside and be further disenfranchised watching their votes stolen and a government that, even without a majority support, launches military strikes against its people. I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. You can talk to him afterwards. Um, thank you so much for coming, and David, thank you so much. We will have you back for the next chapter. I love being here.